So thank you all for coming. Uh, last week, I will, uh, next week I should just say is Talia Fishman from Penn, and then we will have a one week break on the week of March 6th for Penn's spring break. Um, I do want to, just before I introduce Professor Bell, who's with us tonight from Princeton, um, I want to just make a brief note of I, particular importance to many people in the room here. I suspect we learned um, yesterday of the death of Professor Daniel Roche, um, a truly remarkable historian of the of early modern France and the 18th century, and we uh, send our regrets to his family and express our sadness on behalf of the seminar. Um, so, um, but perhaps it is fitting that we will be addressing some of the topics that he devoted his career to. Um, so, on a more positive note, we are really delighted this evening to welcome Professor David Bell of Princeton University, who maybe has attended this seminar once or twice before, but um, we're really happy you made the trip down the down the highway, roadway tonight. Um, at Princeton, uh, David is professor of history and he is the Sydney and Ruth Lapidus professor in the era of North American revolutions, a title I really like. North liked. Atlantic revolutions. North Atlantic revolutions, apologies. Yes, what did I say, the wrong thing. North Atlantic revolutions. Um, uh, just to date myself, I first discovered Professor Bell's work back in the 1990s uh, with a wonderful article that he wrote on the politics of language reform and the battles over French local or patois languages during the revolution. It's called Lingua Popula Lingua Dei, still a great article. Um, as he made clear in that article, debates over language and the nation couldn't and shouldn't be dissociated from matters of religion and the roles of Catholic priests in the French countryside working to educate and missionize. Um, the secularizing revolution, he argued, needed to take into account prior conflicts over religion and religious authority. Um, Professor Bell's work takes, I think, as one of its fundamental concerns, the workings of nationalism and the construction of the kind of national religion that French revolutionaries attempted to build. This is of course, the topic of his uh, book, The Cult of the Nation in France, Inventing Nationalism, 1680 to 1800. And as you can tell from the range of dates in that title, he takes a long view to find a range of practices and ideologies that were churning long before the 1790s. Um, cults of leadership are crucial to this nationalism, and Professor Bell has also devoted several books to the rise of charismatic leaders, including, of course, Napoleon. Uh, his 2020 study on this topic has a great title, Men on Horseback. And I'm really curious to know how some bookstores have shelved that one. Um, but it is actually a serious transatlantic investigation of leaders during the so-called age of revolutions, including Washington, Bolivar, Toussaint, Louis Arthur, and, men, and others. Um, tonight, though, I think we if I'm right, we'll be returning to another aspect of French society that David has worked on for much of his career, the lawyers. Um, his first book from 1994 is Lawyers and Citizens, The Making of a Political Elite, Political Elite in Old Regime France. Um, and tonight we'll focus on one of those avocats with the impressive name, I'll do my best, Claude Rigobert Lefebvre de Beauvray, an early respondent to Montesquieu. Uh, there are some books for those in the room and manuscripts um, that are both early editions of Montesquieu, French and English, and some collections of letters and poetry from that uh, same era uh, with perhaps a little bit of context there and even some Jansenism. Um, Professor Bell's title tonight is Talking Back to the Philosophes, and thank you for being with us. No, thank you. Thank you very much for that really generous introduction, and thank you all very much for coming. I'm really delighted to be here um, in this great seminar. Um, <clears throat> so the current book that I've had the crazy idea of doing is A History of the Enlightenment. Um, it's a little big subject, so I thought for the seminar I should really, in, in the spirit of the seminar, I should do something much smaller, 
a micro historical in fact, and examine a single 18th century letter. Um, let me see now if this is now, of course this is, there we go. Um, and I want to analyze it as an example of Enlightenment era correspondence, but also especially as an example of Enlightenment era reader response, because most of it is a detailed reading of a famous Enlightenment text, namely Montesquieu's Spirit of the Laws. And the letter comes from one of the most remarkable collections of correspondence that I've ever encountered from 18th century France. This was, collection was compiled by a diplomat named Pierre-Michel Hénin. Uh, he kept in touch for several decades with a close set of friends, most of whom he knew from school in Paris, from college. A total of several thousand letters. It's today kept at the Bibliothèque de l'Institut. Um, I was first put onto it uh, by my French colleague Arnaud Orin, but, and then especially by my former advisee, Benjamin Bernard, who made really marvelous use of it for a PhD thesis he defended last year on moral education in early modern France. And I put the uh, cover page of his dissertation up there as well. Um, in his book, he will have the definitive account of the Hanin circle. They called themselves the Morosophs, which is, uh, <laughs> means the wise fools. And, um, <clears throat> and his, his, his book will reveal a, an enormous amount of an 18th century education and male sociability. But the correspondence is also terrifically revealing about the reception of the Enlightenment in, the Fran in France and the way that works were read. So the letter in question was written in March of 1749 uh, to the then 20 year old Henin by a 24 year old lawyer with the unusual name, as we've heard, of Claude Rigobert Lefebvre de Beauvray. And this lawyer is somebody who's actually haunted me throughout much of my career. Uh, long before I learned of his friendship and correspondence with Hénin, which I'm so sorry I missed in my own first book. Uh, Lefebvre was born in 1724 in the heart of the Parisian legal bourgeoisie. His father was a procureur or an attorney or a solicitor in the high court of the Parlement. Uh, Lefebvre de Beauvray himself qualified as a barrister or avocat in 1748. He never had much of a legal career. He lived mostly off rente or state annuities. But he did have a keen interest in politics. He briefly kept a, a detailed manuscript journal about political events. And I found that at least in my first book, uh, Lawyers and Citizens, about lawyers and politics in the 18th century. Um, but Lefebvre de Beauvray was basically like the hero of about 5,000 French novels, which is to say that his family pushed him to be a lawyer and he really wanted to be a writer. <laughs> um, even after he, and this was true, even after he tragically went blind sometime around 1760. So here's a list of his works. He wrote copious poetry. He wrote a novel in the style of Richardson set in England. He wrote a philosophical dictionary in the manner of Voltaire. He was connected with a periodical called the Journal Économique, something I'll come back to. In fact, by the late 1760s, he was turning away from poetry, his first love, and was urging his fellow writers to abandon what he called the old court of the muses for the study of economic science. He claimed that commerce had now united the world into a single body. Uh, and he devoted the longest article of the dictionary that he wrote to the subject of commerce. It's also significant that in one of his early poems, he identifies himself as a soi-disant philosophe, a kind of basically in this context, a would-be philosophe. Um, for all his efforts, he never really achieved the literary success he dreamed of. He did become a member of two provincial academies, but Baron Grimm panned his novel. Uh, at best, his other works got polite short notices in places like the Journal Encyclopédique. But still he kept writing, and actually much of the poetry he composed in the 1750s was patriotic in nature, and I came across it and studied it, in, and it featured in my second book, The Cult of the Nation in France, which, uh, which John has mentioned. So in short, he was typical of a stratum of figures who flitted about the outer edges of Enlightenment literary and philosophical circles and really very, very much wanted to be part of them. Uh, many of these figures were not actually the poor devils who were made famous by Robert Darnton, those writers who lived hand to mouth on Grub Street. Uh, there were certainly a lot of those, but there were also a lot of people like Lefebvre, which is to say well off rentier, um, professionals often who had the time and the leisure to try their hands at writing. They could subsidize the printing of their own works as Lefebvre most likely did. They could submit essays to academic essay competitions as he did on at least one occasion and probably more. They could write occasional pieces for periodicals as he did. Um, but they remain still on the margins of the Enlightenment. I can't resist mentioning also that there's a strange twist to Lefebvre's story, and while it doesn't really matter for this talk that much today, I, I do want to mention it briefly. Although he is 
forgotten today pretty much completely by everybody but myself and my student Ben Bernard. Um, he did write exactly two lines of verse that became world famous. In fact, most of you would probably recognize them. In 1757, amid the upsurge of a patriotic upsurge of the Seven Years' War, he published an eight-page poem called Adresse à la Nation Angloise, addressed to the English nation. And in it, he wrote, speaking directly to England, Va pour s'entre-détruire, arme tes bataillons, d'un sang impur, abreuve tes sillons. So go destroy yourself, arm your battalions, water your furrows with your impure blood. As I'm sure people have recognized, these are in slightly altered form, the concluding lines to the refrain of the Marseillaise. That song was written by, or maybe I should say partly plagiarized, by Claude-Joseph Rouget de Lille in 1792. Um, I actually discovered this little act of partial plagiarism many years ago now. I even published a short journal article about it um, in, in France. Uh, while mostly trivial, the episode does show that the, at least one of Lefebvre's works did reach a fairly broad audience and was still known in the 1790s. Unfortunately, by 1792, Lefebvre himself was in bad, bad decline, probably quite and kept capable of calling out the theft if he even realized it. Um, he died in the first days of the year 1800, probably unaware that the words he composed were now in fact known around the entire world. It's a rather sad fa fate to contemplate. Um, but let me turn from that sad story to the letter, which was written when he was much younger. As I've mentioned, it is mostly an account and a critique of Montesquieu's Spirit of the Laws, which had just been published the previous year. Already in December of 1748, Lefebvre mentioned it to Henin in his correspondence. And to quote, they are clandestinely selling a new work by Monsieur Seconda de Montesquieu, of which I don't know the title. By March, he had found out the title and had actually managed to procure a copy and read it all the way through. Now, of course, we know a great deal about the general intellectual reactions to Montesquieu's book. It stirred up enormous controversy. The historian Gary Cates has just published a book called The Books That Made the European Enlightenment, which has a fascinating chapter about the overall reaction to Montesquieu's, to, to Montesquieu's work. So in one sense, historians are already familiar with a lot of readings of Montesquieu. But for the most part, these readings are themselves carefully crafted works of prose, which stand at a remove from their author's actual experiences of reading the book. Lefebvre's letter is much closer to his actual experience of reading, and it actually discusses that experience in a way that the more formal critiques of Montesquieu generally did not. So I've handed out a partial translation. It's only a partial translation because the letter is really very long, almost 5,000 words. Um, in fact, Lefebvre knew very well that he was probably taxing his friend's patience with what he himself termed a dissertation. Um, to quote from his letter, reasoning, the word is probably already giving you the vapors. Um, but he was also clearly very excited by the book and also rather irritated or disturbed by it. He certainly claimed to be appreciative of Montesquieu. He called him, and I'm quoting, a genius who sees everything and sees him well, nothing escapes him. But most of the letter is actually given over to some very harsh criticism. Much of this was directed at the form of the spirit of the laws. Lefebvre talks about how overly long the parts on French feudal law were, how disconnected and confusing the overall organization was. To quote, how does Monsieur de Montesquieu expect his reader not to lose sight of the thread when he loses it himself from time to time? In a, in a witty stretch of the letter, Lefebvre compares a book to the life of a man. And he says that in the late chapters, the spirit of the laws is already coming to resemble an old man who, quote, has still preserved some traces of the initial vigor of his mind. But by the end of the book, Lefebvre adds, the spirit of the laws had entered its dotage. The author, quote, dreams, he talks drivel. It's not very nice. Now, when it comes to substance, Lefebvre scolded Montesquieu on several counts. First, for saying that, that republics were more naturally expansionist than Sorry, that monarchies were more naturally expansionist than republics. Lefebvre insisted on the reverse and in general showed much less sympathy for republics than Montesquieu did. But he reserved his principal fire, interestingly, for something that is usually not seen as as important in the book, which is Montesquieu's defense of the role of religion in politics against what had been argued by the great Huguenot writer Pierre Bell. Again, with a nice flash of wit, Lefebvre turns Montesquieu on his head here. Montesquieu had said in the spirit of the laws, that it was more important for people to believe that God exists than to believe that any particular person exists. Lefebvre said, nope, um, quote, it has been more useful for the human race that you and Baal have existed than that God exists. 
<coughs> so Lefebvre admitted that Moses had, had successfully used religion to tame a supposedly barbarian people, a common, a common sort of theme in the 18th century. But Lefebvre held up in contrast a West African people called the Serers, whom he had read about in Prévost's travel literature, who supposedly had a virtuous and well-organized society without knowing or worshiping a god. Now, in one sense, there was nothing terribly surprising about Lefebvre's disagreements with Montesquieu. As I said, the book was very controversial, even if Montesquieu's critics more often accused him of atheism than of being overly solicitous of religion. And Montesquieu himself, at least in theory, welcomed some of the criticism in the, public, in the published defense of the spirit of the laws that he wrote and published um, after, you know, after the criticisms had begun to accumulate. He wrote, and I'm quoting from Montesquieu, it, it, it is of course entirely permitted to criticize works that have been given to the public. It would, ridicul it would be ridiculous for those who have wanted to enlighten others not to want to be enlightened in their turn. Of course, he also complained that most of his critics faulted him for not writing the book the way they would have done. But at the same time, as Lefebvre himself noted, the book was almost immediately hailed by many more critics as a complete masterpiece. And in fact, we have here an example of, of a British student who wrote a, a, who wrote a summary of it. And I'll recall that Horace Walpole called The Spirit of the Laws after he finished. He said, this is the greatest book that has ever been written. So it is at least remarkable to find a, an unknown and very young writer, even in a private letter like this, criticizing the book so harshly. All the more strikingly because of the title that Lefebvre uses for Montesquieu. He calls him Monsieur le Président, or in other words, Monsieur the, pres the Presiding Magistrate. Montesquieu was still technically a, par a judge in the Parlement. Lefebvre was a mere apprentice lawyer. You'll note the end of the letter. After going on for many pages about Montesquieu, Lefebvre apologized to his friend Henin for his seriousness and for going on at such length. And he says he'll make up for it by also including an epigram of his own composition. It is about a woman reading the recently published pornographic and materialist novel, Thérèse le philosophe, Thérèse la philosophe, Teresa the philosopher, and pleasuring herself while doing so. In general, the Henin correspondence is full of bawdy wordplay and accounts of sexual conquest, by the, by the young friends, the male friends. Lefebvre clearly wanted to make sure to Henin that his excitement over the spirit of the laws was not eclipsing this aspect of their friendship. Um, the citation of the novel, along also of this particular novel though, along with the criticism of Montesquieu's religious position, does suggest that Lefebvre was flirting with materialism himself. This is also borne out by a 1753 poem he wrote in which he denounced superstition but, and called Jesus a man, whom, a man whom priests had turned into a god. Although incidentally, by 1770 and the dictionary he wrote, he had already turned back to much more conventional religious views. Let me also note one other thing in the letter. As you can see in the translation that I did in the discussion about religion, Lefebvre got so excited that he stopped talking to Henin and actually started speaking to Montesquieu himself. Quote, it has been more useful for the human race that you and Baal have existed. How many more serious prejudices would you not be capable of freeing us from, Monsieur de Montesquieu, if you dared to speak seriously and to speak out loud? So this is not simply a case then of a critic complaining that the author didn't write um, the book in the way he would have done. It's almost a case of a critic saying explicitly, this is where you're going wrong. This is where you're speaking drivel. This is what you should have said. He's almost posing as a kind of co-author in a sense. So. What I want to do now is step back and consider this letter as an example of Enlightenment era reader response. And I think it's worth first thinking about in comparison with one of the most famous studies of Enlightenment era reading, namely Robert Darnton's great essay, Readers Respond to Rousseau from the Great Cat Massacre. Now that essay is based on two principal sources, letters that were written to Rousseau about his novel La Nouvelle Héloïse, and letters written to a New Chatel publisher about Rousseau by a merchant from La Rochelle named Jean Ranson. Um, as Darnton shows, these men and women were in no sense passive readers. They reacted to Rousseau's text, they digested them in Darnton's words, they interpreted and reinterpreted them, and they applied them to their own lives. They read Rousseau intensively rather than extensively, to borrow the terminology of Rolf Engelsing in his hypothesis about an early modern reading revolution. But they didn't read critically, they read worshipfully, taking Rousseau's precepts deeply to heart. As Darnton says, and I'm quoting, Rousseau's pub public probably applied an old style of religious reading to new material, notably the novel, which had previously seemed incompatible with it." Close quote. Now, 
Darnton doesn't claim that these readers that he studied were typical of the French Enlightenment, although he does say that Enlightenment reading remains something of a mystery, and at least with Jean Ranson, we have a dossier that gives us insight into the reading practices of at least one ordinary French bourgeois of the period. I would suggest, incidentally, that the Hennin correspondence, which is really very rich about accounts of reading, represents another such dossier. At the same time, though, Lefebvre's letter obviously points to some very different sorts of reading practices from the one that Darnton underlines. Lefebvre, like Ranson, was a very active and intensive reader, certainly. He was obviously not a worshipful one. He was more of a hypercritical one. Um, now, there have always been hypercritical readers. I don't mean to suggest that there's anything particularly original or specific to the Enlightenment about the fact that Lefebvre was expressing such sharp criticism of a great author. I'm sure there were young Athenians dissecting Aristotle to their friends with similar fervor, um, <clears throat> just as there are today graduate students who dissect what we do with similar fervor. But there are two things that Lefebvre's criticism, I think, does suggest about the Enlightenment world, which he was just then entering in the year 1749, and I want to spend the rest of my time on these things. To introduce the first of them, I wanted to say something which is actually pretty entirely obvious, which is that there's no such thing as reading in the abstract. For all the terrific work that has been done on the history of reading, including by people in this room, um, we all know that the, that the same people will read different texts in different ways. They read the Bible differently from the morning newspaper or from a textbook or from a short story. And often the way they read can be at least in part dictated by the authors themselves. Rousseau, as Darnton says, had very definite ideas about how people should have read him. He spelled this out many times, notably in the preface to the new Eloise. To quote Rousseau, whoever resolves to read these letters must arm himself with patience about the incorrectness of their language, the overblown character of their style. He must not say to himself in advance that those who wrote them are not French, not sophisticates, but almost children whom in their romantic imaginations take the innocent frenzy of their minds to be philosophy. Quote from Rousseau. Now, having made this point, I actually want to turn from Darnton's essay to a much more recent book, the French literature scholar Eleanor Rousseau's Styles of Enlightenment. Great book. And in this book, she calls Jean-Jacques Rousseau's prose style the style of the rostrum, of the podium. Um, his style for her, she, calls, she terms it didactic, often thundering. It harkens back to the Calvinist pulpit of his youth or to his visions of the Athenian agora and the Roman forum. It insists on its own sincerity, and it deliberately encourages precisely the sort of worshipful reading that the men and women examined by Darnton professed, at least in their letters, to be doing. But Rousseau is not the only writer she studies, and it's not the only style of enlightenment that she studies in this book. She spends more of her time on a very different style, um, <clears throat> which I would suggest called forth a very different style of reading. This style, style trace, traces back to what was called in French literature the goût moderne, and there was nothing thundering or didactic about it. At one point, in fact, Eleanor Rousseau calls it the style of the boudoir. It was intimate, it was playful, it was dialogic, it championed wit and theatricality in the breaking down of traditional literary forms. Its authors reveled in puzzles and games and sly self-referentiality. It was worldly, mondain, and it was deeply social. It insisted on the importance of intercourse between men and women in every possible sense of the word for the health of a society. Now, Eleanor Russo casts Montesquieu very convincingly as entirely on the side of the goût moderne, the style of the boudoir. For all his admiration for the Romans, he never made a cult of sublime antique virtue the way Jean-Jacques Rousseau did, or the Jacobins for that matter. In Montesquieu's scholarly works, as well as in his novel Persian letters, he deliberately subverted conventions, he experimented with stylistic boundaries. His language and his concepts as well were playful. He littered his prose with discontinuities and puzzles. This style, as Eleanor Rousseau points out, elicited a great deal of criticism, some of it similar to what Lefebvre de Beauvray actually put in his letter. He wasn't the only reader who accused Montesquieu of losing the thread, le fil. Rousseau, oh, sorry, Voltaire, a couple of years later, wrote this about the spirit of the laws, and I'm quoting, I was looking for a thread, un fil, in that labyrinth, but the thread would break at almost every chapter. I have found the esprit, the spirit of the author, but seldom the esprit of the laws, l'esprit des lois. That's Voltaire. Um, but Montesquieu's style, I would argue, is one that deliberately invited the critical engagement of readers. As his readers have always known, Montesquieu was a puzzling reader in the full sense of the word. He deliberately set puzzles. After pu publishing Persian letters, 
with its discontinuous structure and its constant digressions. He boasted that there was a secret chain that wove through the book, and he invited readers to, to find it. In the spirit of the laws, he takes a key chapter to outline the constitution of a mixed state, and he calls it on the Constitution of England. And then he mentions specific in the English institutions nowhere in the text. Is he offering it as a model or is he not? He doesn't say. Now, the Straussian scholar Paul Ray has made a very compelling case that Montesquieu always wrote with the censor in mind, deliberately disguising his more subversive political ideas, but leaving clues for the discerning reader. Paul Ray also shows how Montesquieu's work on the causes of the greatness of the Romans and their decadence was originally planned as part of a larger polemical work uh, on universal monarchy, but that Montesquieu probably shelved the plan for fear that its implications would bring the wrath of the censor down on him. But censorship alone is not enough to explain Montesquieu's embrace throughout his career of this deliberately playful style of the boudoir. Again, the style deliberately invited the reader's critical engagement. Voltaire, also a puzzling writer, if ever there was one, um, as Jennifer Tzien has, has pointed out, uh, wrote in the preface to his philosophical dictionary a line that I absolutely love because Voltaire said, the best books are the ones that are half, writ half written by the reader. The best books are the ones that are half written by the readers. And despite Voltaire's own criticism of the spirit of the laws, I think the spirit of the laws actually exemplifies this quality. And Montesquieu himself seemed to invite engagement of this sort explicitly in his Défense de l'Esprit des Lois, defense of the book. To quote again, it would be ridiculous for those who've wanted to enlighten others not to want to be enlightened in their turn about what they've written. Now in his letter, Lefebvre de Beauvray himself reads Montesquieu in exactly these terms as a writer who actively invited critical engagement. Let me quote from the beginning of his letter. Can one prevent oneself from holding forth with an author who gives you so much more to think about than he seems to have thought about himself, an author who reflects a great deal, who always leaves you with material for ample reflections of your own who does not so much say everything there is to say on a subject, but rather makes suggestions and leads one to understanding. With these people, it is not simply a matter of thinking and using one's reason, but also taking the trouble to follow them closely and to raise them up when they fall down. So it's a little satirical here, but still, he's directly discussing the experience of reading Montesquieu and explicitly saying that Montesquieu's style elicited his own critical engagement. He also, of course, did criticize Montesquieu's style. He didn't like the discontinuities. He got irritated by the playfulness. Um, and he got really frustrated by the bits on French feudal law, which I think most of us would share that frustration. But if we look at the sweep of his correspondence with Henin from the period, it's clear that he had no problem with the goût moderne as such. A couple of months after writing this letter, he sent Henin another long missive about another famous work of the Enlightenment, in this case, Diderot's letter on the blind. This was a book in which he clearly had more philosophical sympathy, given the materialist convictions that he still held. But that work also could be seen as typical of the goût moderne. Eleanor Russo writes about it. Lefebvre had nothing at all critical to say about its playful and sometimes confusing form. But here's also an interesting thing about the letter I'm focusing on here, the one you, you have up. Despite its criticism of Montesquieu's style, it actually adopts its own version of the goût moderne maybe quite unconsciously. The letter itself is playful, um, or rather, you know, since, and it's, it's witty, or maybe we would say, since he's, he is no Montesquieu, that he strains for wit, he strains for playfulness. Sometimes he gets there, sometimes he doesn't. Um, he jokes about Montesquieu losing the thread of his own work. At another point, when talking about the long stretches on, on French feudal law, he compares these sections of the book to a stormy ocean and the persevering reader who gets to the end of it to a sailor who finally sights land at the end um, after a long and difficult journey. As I mentioned, he compares a book to the life of a man and quips that the, that the spirit of the laws falls into sort of drooling senility in its final chapters. Again, he's straining for wit here. He pauses again and again to joke with Henin. He goes back and forth between addressing Henin and addressing Montesquieu himself. And then there's that epigram at the end in which he says to, say to Henin, well, I've been boring you, so here's a little bawdiness. Here's some light pornography to wake you up. Um, this little epigram is not exactly the equal to the story of Ibrahim and Anais from Montesquieu's Persian Letters with its fantasy of a heaven of sexual pleasure for women amidst reflections on despotism and liberty, but it is in something of the same spirit. Um, I should note also that one of Lefebvre's own earliest published works, a letter, an essay on the human heart, that he published in 1753, 
was written in very much the same playful, discursive, and, discontin and often discontinuous style. And I can't resist noting that while it had far, far fewer readers than the spirit of the laws, Lefebvre himself was occasionally capable of eliciting critical reactions from his readers. So this is the Princeton University copy of the book he published in 1753, and it's, it's covered with marginalia from, a, from an early reader, generally disparaging marginalia. As you can see here, it actually says, you run after, you strain, in other words, you run after wit, you, you run after wit, monsieur le philosophe, but reason abandons you and you wander amidst phrases empty of meaning. Ouch, <laughs> harsh reading here, but, he, but Lefebvre was a harsh reader himself. So that's the first point and the major point that I want to make, that Lefebvre's practice of reading was shaped, I think, in some deep ways by Montesquieu's own text, by key elements of Montesquieu's own style. Unlike Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Montesquieu did not tell his readers in so many words how he wanted them to read him, but he did nonetheless through his style, and Lefebvre responded. And he responded despite the deep substance and criticisms he had of Montesquieu, despite his disapproval of Montesquieu's political and religious positions. Now the second point, and it's much simpler because I'm running out of time, but um, good thing is, 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 much, is again much simpler. I, I do think it's important to note simply that Lefebvre was reading Montesquieu in an intellectual environment that was becoming increasingly saturated by formal regular criticism, book criticism in printed periodicals. Lefebvre was a regular reader of, of periodicals himself. He mentions them often in his correspondence. Also a fact about Lefebvre, he taught himself English and, very, and probably had access to at least some of the considerably larger number of periodicals than being published in Britain. In a few years, he himself would collaborate on the founding of a journal dedicated to political economy with another member of the Anna Circle, the best known of them, Butel de Dumont. Dumont, sorry, Butel Dumont, the, 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 who flitted around with the physiocrats. Um, I think it is worth considering the changes that occur in reading practice when readers have access to regular book criticism, when they can encounter a range of opinions about the books they're reading or considering reading. Now, Lefebvre wrote the letter that I've been discussing only a few months after the initial publication of The Spirit of the Laws, probably before he had seen any published criticism of it. But of course, what he was doing in his letter was precisely writing a book review of sorts for his friend Henin, who had not seen the book. Already in reading the, the text, he was not simply digesting it, as Darnton would put it. He was not simply mentally criticizing. He was actually, in a sense, thinking about how he would write about it himself. The expansion of book reviewing, incidentally, was taking place against the landscape in which well-off Parisian bourgeois like Hanin had more cultural products than ever before to choose from and more access to critical advice in making their choices. Uh, they were not just selecting books and periodicals. They were se selecting engravings and other artwork for their homes. They were selecting musical scores to play on instruments that they bought. They were selecting furniture, ceramics, and of course clothing, and a broad range of other consumer products. We can point to all sorts of ways, of course, in which a variety of social pressures, practices, and expectations did limit their choices. And I'm being, <clears throat> I think, and I'm being very daring speaking of choices in front of Professor Rosenfeld here. Anyway, um, <clears throat> but this, but the fact that their choices were in fact very limited in practice did not change the impression that that men like Lefebvre had that they did enjoy a broad freedom in making these choices, a sort of autonomy in how they could construct their daily lives from what they ate to what they wore to what they read and how they read it. In all these ways, they were what we could call active consumers, just as they could compare chocolate and coffee to their particular taste. They could have the, the clothes they bought to suit not just their style, but their particular taste. And in a parallel way, they could see themselves as active participants in the world of letters. Now this was, as scholars have been showing for a long time now, a moment when largely unknown figures had more ways than ever before to participate in intellectual discourse. They could enter academic essay competitions, as Rousseau famously did. They could write letters to the editors of periodicals or submit articles to the periodicals, as Elizabeth Bond has shown in a recent book on the subject. They could write directly to an author or to that author's publisher, as Darnton discussed in his own great essay. Serious literary fame and the wealth and, and privilege that accompanied it was still as difficult as ever to attain. But the barriers to attaining at least some attention as a man of letters were rarely so low, at least for people with a secure income, like Lefebvre de Beauvais. The sense of being able to participate was empowering. And I would suggest that even when he was just 24, in early 1749, Lefebvre already felt some of this empowerment in the way that he approached a text like Montesquieu's. Obviously, I'm not saying that these Enlightenment texts were in any way a simple reflection or epiphenomenon of the consumer revolution of the period. But there are important intersections between 
this changing consumer culture and the styles of reading and what was being read. And I think that deserves much more study. Now to conclude, I certainly wouldn't want to claim that Claude Rigobert, Lefebvre de Beauvray can be called a typical enlightenment reader or the typical enlightenment letter writer for that matter. Most 18th century French correspondence does not contain 5,000 letter, 5,000 word dissertations on a work of political philosophy. But I would suggest that the letter illustrates in particularly high relief what a certain sort of enlightenment reading could be. Deeply engaged, deeply critical, highly sensitive to the style of what was being read and having little regard for the authority of the author. It was a form of reading that tried to bring the author into correspondence, into the conversation, very literally in, in, the, in the moments when Lefebvre starts talking directly back to Montesquieu, asking him questions and telling him what he did wrong. In many respects, this sort of reading is diametrically opposed to the later Enlightenment sort that Robert Darnton found among the acolytes of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, which was just as engaged, but largely uncritical and involved a kind of unconditional surrender to the authority of the author. These two sorts of reading reflect different facets, different sides of the Enlightenment, but I think that when taken together, they help, they help us see just how deeply the content and style of Enlightenment books could penetrate into the way that readers read and readers thought. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, David. Um, yeah, if you want to bring up a gallery behind us, so we will monitor the Zoom and we'll start with the room. And of course, we'll start with Liliana Weisberg. Hi. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Um, you have made us aware of the complication of authorship and leadership on the side of what you want to on the side of the framework, on the side of, well, maybe with and against uh, something. Uh, but I would like to go to focus on another reader, the reader of the letter written. Mm -hmm. And I want to distinguish between address and reader. Is the address necessarily the reader? That means, is the read, is the letter really just for the one reader to whom it is seemingly written in the way that you are also questioning authorships and readership within the letter? Or is it also something that was perhaps to circulate? to be discussed, to be part of the conversation, as it is often done at that time as well. And if that is the case, then it may complicate the matter even more. Mm -hmm. It's a, no, that, thank you, that's a great question. Um, and the, the basic answer is I don't know, because I don't, we don't have any evidence of it. I don't know if there's a letter that Henan wrote back to Lefebvre about this letter, we don't have it. He kept drafts of most of his letters, but not all of them. And we don't have Lefebvre's own collection of correspondence. We only have Hanan's. So I certainly don't have any direct evidence about this. My, my suspicion is actually not, because, these, because the letters, um, <clears throat> because the, simply from my sense of these two, of these two people, um, Le, there's another aspect that I didn't go into, um, but Hanan was, was four years younger. Than, than Lefebvre. He was himself training to be an avocat. He would become a diplomat. And the reason we have so much of this correspondence is that he would, he would be abroad for most of the, the subsequent decades. And so he was desperate to keep in touch with his school, with his, with his friends. Um, so my, my sense is that Lefebvre was doing this more as a kind of professor. He was doing this more as a, you know, because he, he really wanted to impress this younger and also wealthier friend of his. Um, it, it could be that he wanted Hena to circulate the letter, um, but again, I don't have any. I don't have any evidence of it. Can I, sure. Can I just uh, I'm, I'm very interested in the development of, of the public school. Mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm working on material on the other side of the line, and there I'm getting all these kind of responses of insult that people have forwarded the letter. And so mm -hmm. Read it in all kinds of social uh, 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 settings or not. If this is not the case, it would be very interesting for me as well in terms of, let's call it a private legacy, mm -hmm. or what you say, the teacher student relation or whatever. So, so when is 
When is it this and when is it something else? Well, and how does it then distinguish itself from what it is focused on? I think, no, that's, I, I, I think it would be, it, I, one thing I will say also just about this, this is still very much work in progress that I'm doing um, and that my student Ben Bernard has done. We have not, you know, we, Hana corresponded regularly with about, at least about nine or 10 people at the time. And we have not found any mention of the letter in any of his correspondence with his other members of the circle, but we haven't gone through everything yet. So it's possible that there are some mentions of it in there. Um, most likely if it did circulate, there would be some, in, in the correspondence between Hana and one of his friends, there would be a, a mention of it but we have not we have not seen it. It's possible. It's also possible that it was intended as such, and that Henan gets this letter and says, "Oh my God, what am I going to do with this? It's so long, and it's so and it's and it's so weird. I don't, you know, and just put it. I have no idea. Sometimes but, we don't know the answer. But it's things. sorry, it's Henan's copy into his own book, or it is in. No, no, this letter is in. This letter is this letter is Lefebvre's letter in his handwriting. Inserted that, into a big collection. It's inserted. It's bound into bound a big in. volume, which alternates. I, 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 and I'm not sure when the when it was bound. It okay. was probably bound after Hanan's death okay. from the letters he collected. But wait, but it, it's what's interwoven are Lefebvre's letters and the draft responses by Hanan. Uh -huh. Okay. 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 <clears throat> I'm puzzled by something because it's the relation between the letter is presented and the author text mm -hmm. the Lefebvre, which is Melange, Tunel. Yes. Uh, yes. In 1755. Exactly. And in this text, uh, in verse, what is uh, striking is uh, just the uh, inverted situation in relation yeah. with the letter. Yeah. Because he prayed this with the law as being the moment in which the uh, enemy of Dieu will be defeated. Yes. Exactly. And uh, the text is understood as uh, destroying the anti and the. Uh, 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 Hostile to uh, the religion. So, how do you interpret this? My interpretation would be that the text of the Eloge uh, has to be understood as irony. Mm. I am not sure because all the context, it's a very serious text. Uh, the verse are not excellent, but uh, because it's a uh, verse. But nevertheless, it seems that there is no irony in this uh, situation. So, did it change between 1749 uh, 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 and uh, 1755? Uh, is there some constraint upon the, re the writing of the Eloge Funèbre and to whom it was uh, addressed? That it, it's really, <clears throat> really striking to see this yes. uh, quite opposite description of the same book yes. by the same man uh, with a difference <laughs> of uh, less than 10 years. No, thank you. I've, I'm delighted you asked that because, you know, I was asked, you know, but I didn't have time in, in since I just had about 30, 35 minutes to, to mention this, this, the Eloge. So in 1757, Lefebvre, or 1755, when Montesquieu dies, sorry, Lefebvre does write and publish an Eloge de Montesquieu, which is as, exactly as, as Roger Chartier just described it. It is, it is, it is very conventional um, for the time, and it praises Montesquieu for exactly the things that Lefebvre de Beauvray um, I had denounced in the letter. And my, so the couple of things that, I mean, I've, I've read, I think pretty much everything Lefebvre de Beauvray ever wrote, it's rather painful <laughs> experience in some cases, he was not the greatest writer, um, but things really did change over this period for several reasons. Well, first of all, he's writing this for publication and he's writing this because he's very ambitious. He wants to, he wants fame. And so, and he wants, and most of the things that he publishes are very conventional in the poetic style, um, the letter on the human heart is the earliest thing, and it's not so conventional. And then I think as, he's, as he was not getting any success, he moves away from this. Then there's another thing which has happened between, between, um, between 1749 and 1755, which is the outbreak of hostilities between England and France in North America, which he was very aware of because he writes about the initial incidents in 1754 in which um, actually in, in which the young George Washington kills a French envoy and actually starts the hostilities off. And so Lefebvre decides at this point to become an arch patriot and, and he becomes an, a, a, an absolute fanatical defender of the French monarchy. He is writing this address to the English nation that he publishes just a couple of years after the Eloge. And my suspicion is that he is, he is doing this out of ambition. Maybe he's doing it out of a change of heart, I don't know, but it's certainly, but the Eloge is certainly in line with everything he publishes in this period. And I mean, interestingly, he, I mean, he mentions the Eloge in later letters, and he just says, I've written this. He says to Hanal, I've written this, but he doesn't say much about it. So my sense is simply that, you know, he contradicted himself, fundamentally. 
Um, and that, but ultimately, in, in that sense, he was becoming a much less interesting writer than when he wrote this letter. So thank you. Thank you for the question. Yes. So let's have Sophie and then Drew. Hmm. Very, very interesting, the letter. And I think this argument works very well for the letter mm -hmm. in the sense that it's the, the intersection of the kind of playfulness in, in, in the kind of larger cultural sense and inside the letter is quite right. Even the quote you put up from what was it called? The singularité. L'univers uh, sans prose et envers. It's about coquetterie, and it sort of also goes in the same vein. But how much can you generalize from that? Mm -hmm. Question, I guess. And the question you made, the point you made at the end about the sort of intersection between consumer culture mm -hmm. and Enlightenment styles, mm -hmm. sort of the one relying upon the other, this dialogue and form. I wonder if that holds across geography mm -hmm. and time. Yeah. So let's say you think of Kant. You heard the um, my friend didn't even say that either, but you know, Königsberg is not the hotbed of consumer culture for 18th century Europe. And yet, the description of the Republic of Letters is a very dialogic one. It's a, a kind of, it's not um, what we call the kind of um, worshipful reading practices. No, of course. So at all. And then I can think of other places where you might have the inverse. Mm -hmm. Places where you might have a fairly felt consumer culture, but not much of a <coughs> enlightenment playfulness. Answer them, of course. Mm -hmm. You would get the inverse. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if this is very particular. To the new year you're looking at, or is it really generalizable as sort of enlightenment? Um, <laughs> no, you're absolutely you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's it's it is it is it is hard to generalize enormously from this. Um, obviously, I think there are a great number of things that go into making a kind of intellectual environment like this possible, where you have you know this kind of reading and this kind of style. It is not only, and I certainly don't in any sense mean to say that it is only. The consumer culture at all, and I think Amsterdam, where you have a very different intellectual heritage there, um, which and and where you don't have anything like the Gumo down in Dutch culture, you know, you're not going to have this. You're not going to have this probably in, in much of Europe, maybe most of Europe. Um, so I so I don't mean to say in the least that that the one implies the other. What I mean to say is that there are intersections. I think that there there can be reinforcements. But I think that in this Parisian milieu, which is a very important milieu for the Enlightenment, that you do have the, the intersection of this kind of, you know, developing consumer culture and these, these styles, that there it happens to work very well together. In other places, it certainly doesn't. But here it works well, and I think that one can, that one can therefore, you know, suggest that, there, that there's a kind of reading here that, you know, that is very much in sync with that. That's really all I want to suggest here. But again, since we, I think the letter is really a wonderful document, we have relatively few pieces of you know, documents that are this rich and describing the experience of reading for the period. So I think it is very much worth at least bringing this out as, one, as, a, as a data point, basically. And I certainly, on one letter, would not mean to generalize from it much more. But I think it's a very suggestive data point. So Drew, Zach, Phil. So, hey, Drew, how are you? Um, really enjoyed the talk. And I, I guess I would bring it back down to the micro web as a media, actually. Yeah. And I was really struck the distinction uh, between intensive critical reading on the one hand yeah. and intensive reverential reading on the other. Mm -hmm. And you do say you have evidence of the fab reading of their works, you said Diderot. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if there are other letters where he talks about, I mean, if he talks about Rousseau. Um, but if he actually adopts kind of the author's frame uh, when he's reading Rousseau as opposed to Montesquieu, and actually, if in fact the author does have more power over his reading, mm -hmm. um, then you might think that this kind of, is, is Montesquieu just the author that you read intensively and critically, and Rousseau is just an author that you read intensively and uh, uh, rather than Good, no, great question. Thank you. So, so, I mean, there, are, and again, I mean, I th there are a lot of different factors that will go into the way you know you're reading this here. Um, also, I think you know Lefebvre's own his his age at the time is relative. You know, his, you know the fact that he's still sort of experimenting intellectually. He does write about Rousseau later. He's you know quite quite critically and briefly, dismissively almost. You know, you know I think he's one point. You know, I think the word insane comes up once. In describing Rousseau, not the only 18th century person to, to describe Rousseau. Mm -hmm. Diderot, um, again, it's 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 very sympathetic 
Um, and the letters are also quite playful, but they're but they're much less long and much less involved. This is, I mean, again, this is, you know, and it, 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 it's an exceptional letter. And I will admit absolutely that it's an exceptional letter. I think with Diderot, he was much more, um, on the one hand, he was much more, um, I think, uh, insane, you know, much more, you know, much more, he, he wasn't as irritated by it. He actually really liked it. Um, but at the same time, I think he was being a little more careful because of the, because of the very clear materialism of, of Diderot's text to be too praising of it. To his to his to to his friends again, particularly if the letter circulated, that might be you know you, you know a reason to be careful about that. And as I was saying in my response to Roger Chatti, I mean over the years he becomes a far more you know far more conventional in his outlook, um, and the letters become much less rich about the reading experience. Unfortunately, um, I would say you know again the other evidence we have is is his own writings, and he's certainly he he is a bit of a chameleon in his writing style when he writes his 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 novel Miss Onoha. He, he's very much trying to imitate Richardson and, and, to, and to write a kind of Richards, Richardsonian novel. Um, in his Dictionnaire Social et Patriotique is what he calls it. He, he is, he, you know, he's trying to imitate Voltaire, but in a much more sort of staid and, conven and conventional register. Um, but to still, be, to still be witty, but also you know, but to sort of please the authorities. And he's obviously trying to, I mean, he's trying to please the authorities here too. It seems quite, quite clear to me. So. There are a lot of things that are going into to his reading, and I wouldn't, and I certainly wouldn't say that in every case he has he's as you know sort of drawn into the style. But it's it's showing what can what is possible, but not what happens all the time with him. Yeah, Zach. Thank you. That was really interesting, and um, the idea of thinking about reading style that, mm -hmm. in relationship to other cultural changes in particular that I think is why I want to follow up not on the consumer culture, but the other point you mentioned, mm -hmm. which I found very persuasive is the rise of book reviews. Mm -hmm. I mean, there have always been hypercritical readers, but there have not always been people writing a 5,000 word <laughs> book review. I mean, in a mm -hmm. sense, this letter seems to me very unlikely before the genre of book review mm -hmm. exists. And so I wonder if you could say more, I don't know enough. I mean, the style, he's obviously a magpie, and he knows English, and the style here does, it has stylistics, some stylistic similarities to like a uh, spectator, mm -hmm. I would yeah. say. The shift in dress, mm -hmm. the, 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 mm. the combination of tone, yeah. um, serious, joking, um, familiarity. You know, yeah. it, it, so I don't know if he's reading spectator, and I don't know the French period, mm -hmm. but do you see, I think it, one avenue that might pay off would be to, to pursue, you know, really a more kind of literary critical connections between these book reviews, what types of phrases are typically used, mm -hmm. are they popping up here? It seems to me that if you're writing 5,000 words, you're writing in a genre that you are familiar with. Yeah. Else, right? yeah, no, I think exactly. I mean, I, I didn't really have time to develop that, that, you know, that, that enough, but I think that's, I mean, certainly in the Republic of Letters, you have people writing very long letters about books. I think that that's clear and very long critical letters about books. So I'm not sure that there's anything you know, again, particularly original about about the 18th century and that. But again, the style here, I mean, you know, the kind of correspondence in the Republic of Letters where people dissected other people's books to their correspondence tended to be more serious. Tend, I mean, it, did, it didn't have this kind of shift, shifting of registers. They, perhaps it did. I'm happy to, you know, if I would love to see incident if people know of cases of it, I would love to see it. But I think, you know, but he is clearly being influenced. I mean, he is I mean, he does try to start a periodical himself. He does get seriously involved in this attempt to um, to study to start a periodical called the Journal Économique, and so that has clearly been. And so, he, and he's clearly a an avid reader of periodicals. He mentions he mentions you know mostly he mentions you know French periodicals, the Journal Encyclopédique, the you know the Journal des Savants. He mentions these occasionally in his correspondence. Um, you know the later you know the Journal Encyclopédique quite a bit later. So so I so I do think he's you know he's 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 very much. You know, att attentive and attuned to the to 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 that into that style. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Bill and then Richard. Clearly, it's really very interesting on this letter, and your problem is how to work out from the letter yes. related to a larger <laughs> social history of the audience. Right. I think several suggestions have been made already. Letter writing as a social practice. Mm -hmm. It's very well is one. There is uh, also, in terms of reading practices, everybody knows about commonplace books, mm -hmm. but there was also a genre that is somewhat less known, as well, of anima versiones, where you would take detailed notes and make comments on the books that you are reading as well. Now, I've only read one of these. 
which dates from the 1670s and 80s, which is the reading notes of a pastor in Britain, Boston pastor in Britain. Uh, and I don't remember all the details of it, but he is at once writing, uh, taking notes that might be of interest to him, uh, factual information that could be of interest for sermons, but is also criticizing books for flaws or comparing the information in one with what he finds in another. And I believe he makes comments about the style as well. So it'd be very interesting to see if there are multiple collections of these, maybe Jimmy Miller and others, uh, and see how that that practice of note taking mm -hmm. and reading uh, is carried out. In, in his case, he's not writing it for other people. In fact, it begins with a charming introduction. He's stuck in this tiny little parish in Brittany, and nobody much comes. Fortunately, there's a noble woman who buys a lot of the latest books and passes some of them along to him. And he realizes he isn't going to amount too much, but uh, at least he can keep notes on his reading. Mm -hmm. This is how he consoles himself his provincial life. He too had written some some verse early in life, but he's pretty much given that up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, thank you. That's a great suggestion. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of a follow-up to so, Sophie's question, the whole note, the relationship of, of these this led into the wider, cult, let's call it the critical culture of, of the era. And I was interested in the fact that they both have legal training. Yeah. And it is a book about the spirit of the laws, and he talks about the vast chaos of capitularies, prescriptions, Salic laws, the law of the Lombard, the law of the German. This guy has read a lot of boring texts. Uh -huh. With a lot and, and, and he's read commentaries, presumably on these texts. Mm -hmm. And if there's one genre that is, is it pays a lot of attention to word per se, it's the guys you know, yeah. Procura and mm -hmm. Africa. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that the fact that they're both part of a legal world, and I wonder whether there's a kind of legal reading as opposed to a, just a general consumer cultural reading that distinct that distinguishes this particular letter. And this phenomenon that you're talking about the 1740s and 50s. That's a no. That's a really great point, Richard. Thank you. I mean, I think that's absolutely right. I think there's certainly and certainly in the preparation to become a an avocat au parlement, there, you know, often there would be a certain amount of training of dissecting texts like this, taking notes, things like that. Um, one problem is we don't know how. Um, how seriously either of these men took their legal training. It was certainly yeah. entirely possible in the 18th century basically to go out to France to bribe a couple of professors and you walk out with your law degree. And then, you know, if you if you if you if you wanted to be a serious avocat, then you would then you would do a stage and you would study. Um, Lefebvre does do a stage briefly, but he's not but he's clearly but his heart is not in it. I mean he's not um, and again you can see how bored he gets with the law. I mean if he if he, if he were more of a lawyer at heart he might have actually you know, made it through that section with fewer kvetches, right? Um, you know, so, so, um, but I, but I, but I do think, but he certainly had at least some training of this sort. And also, of course, there, to come back to what, what Phil Benedict said, I mean, there's also simply the, you know, the practices of, 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 of being a schoolboy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these, these two men were schoolboys together at, at Collège de Beauvais. And so they, you know, and there's practices of note taking, which they would have learned there as well. So there's, and then Benjamin Bernard, whom I mentioned, my student who has also worked on this collection, um, you know, has, has talked about those connections there to the Henan correspondence. So thank you. Can I push the circle thing uh, even a little mm -hmm. bit further too? I, 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 so can you, can you tell us more about who's, who's in the circle? We got, mm -hmm. I got two, we got two, mm -hmm. um, got a little more about their legal connections and or youthful connections. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, my my frame of reference is this is a little bit like Franklin's Junto, maybe mm -hmm. not. Yeah. Um, there's a sort of self-education move here, although mm -hmm. these guys have had more education, formal education than someone like Franklin. Probably. Yeah. Um, but how big is the circle? Um, it sounds very male. I mean, especially totally, with it's it, totally and, male. and it's I'd totally be interested male. in the, so there's a homo social very much so. Circle to the circle, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, do you have any like physical evidence of actual exchanges of letters or you know material practices that can help us sort of get the sketches of where these people are living, how often they're seeing each other, anything like that? 
Well, I mean, they're, they're not seeing each other. Many of them are not seeing each other very often. So Anna at this point is, is in Versailles, which is not that far from Paris, but he's not coming in that often. So he is corresponding to Lefebvre, who's living in Paris. I mean, Lefebvre, Anna is training to, at this point to be a diplomat. Okay. Um, you know, they have, you know, again, there, there are people, I mean, of the people that we, you know, that, that, that and I'll go, you know, it's been mostly Benjamin Bernard's work here, which he's worked more on the circle than I have. Okay. Um, but it is, you know, it is, um, you know, there are some, there are, there are other lawyers, there are other people who are trying, you know, basically trying for writing careers. There's a writer named Patu who briefly becomes quite famous. He knows, he knows Voltaire and then he dies tragically young. Um, there's Butel Dumont who becomes known as, as a member of sort of the physiocratic circle. Mm. Um, so there, are, um, but what you say about homosociality is, is, a, is a very important point. And here again, let me just shout out to, 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 ben, to ben Bernard's dissertation here, because one of the arguments he makes on the circle is that it is very important when we look at basically, you know, forms of sociability before the French Revolution, you know, people look at, at you know, at the Salon and things like that. I mean, um, but yeah, that's at these, but these circles often very intensely male circles, often literary sex circles are very important for bond for, for sort of the way that people will behave with each other, the forms of sociability. So that, for example, there's, there's a famous literary circle in Amiens of which both Robespierre and, um, and Carnot are briefly part of themselves. And, you know, and, and they, they, they often exchange sort of things that they've written, they exchange pieces of verse, they exchange, um, you know, they, 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 they exchange mistresses. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's a very, you know, sort of homosocial sort of sexual relationship through the common relationship with, with women that happens in these circles. And so I, I do think all of that is, is, is really important for understanding the group and how it operates, absolutely. Yeah, which I mean, in the bigger story of the Enlightenment, yeah. maybe, yeah. right, we have to, yeah. of, it's not just the salon culture. That no, no, and it is, and it is unlike the salon culture, it is intensely male yeah. and exclusionary and, ex, and, and exclusionary women. Yeah. 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 Uh, back then. This is totally out of left field and maybe a very dumb question, but uh, it's inspired by being a Shakespearean, and yeah. you can't read the, anytime anyone mentions Salic Law, Henry V, of course. So I'm just ah. curious, to what extent is the is the joking about Salic law and the law, the, the feudal laws, is that common? Is is it unusual that he's joking about it, or is it a kind of joke because it's so arcane and so? Yeah, that sounds like the law school thing. I think it's probably. I mean, I, I actually I don't, know, gets the, I don't know the answer. I mean, but the law Salic, which you know, was was in Germany. Right. <laughs> because it's the same joke. Too. No, yeah, it's, it's the same though. It's the same joke that Shakespeare is making. Absolutely, mm. I don't. I don't actually. I can't recall a lot of people joking about this. Uh, okay. <laughs> but it's quite. It sounds like a kind of Dickens, you know. Joke yeah. About the, yeah. No, no. I mean, I remember the the scene in the uh, what is it in the in the in the Olivier movie where the archbishop is like. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, yeah. Thinking about your your last comment about the the homosexuality of the group, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering if you think the style itself. Is a masculine style. Mm -hmm. In some ways, I would say it's not because the one place you do see women involved in a lot is in this piece, this kind of realm of jokes and epigrams and paradoxes and things. So, you know, mm. I'm not sure how quickly I was sort of thrown mm. on the male basket here. <laughs> well, it's but it's but it's but I think it is. Yeah, but it is the men doing it only with other men and 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 and, and mixing it in with. You know stories of their mistresses and sexual conquests and epigrams like this, where the woman is talking, where Teresa is, the woman is talking about you know the books you read with one hand. Right. So, but it's, a, but it's also a style of writing that eventually, unlike sort of a learned style, does allow women. In oh, absolutely. And provides a kind of opening. Absolutely. For women's participation in the common culture. And it is bound up with, and it is also bound up with a kind of Montesquieuian notion of, 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 what, of what would come to be called civilization, which in which women have an absolutely central place. Right. So I, mean, both of those things I, think I think I think I think what we can conclude here is the men are being hypocrites. Mm. <laughs> <Darking>. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> yeah, Roger. <clears throat> you think it seems to me that perhaps there is also, uh, you said it was 24 when you write the letter, and so there is this uh, attitude to the criticize, to make irony, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, already constituted authority. Mm -hmm. So perhaps the question of the uh, generation and elite which that you described as this kind of responsibility uh, in the law school could be uh, an element. And the other element, uh, you, you said uh, 
He was blind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But until what point? Because it goes by the 1760. Yeah. Yeah. And, oh, yeah, it's 1760. Yeah, he was he was he was 36. He, he published uh, uh, something. Uh, oh, he, he, he dict must have dictated it. And like so Milton. It's, uh, it's a great issue about disability studies. Now we can compensate <laughs> the blindness. That is to say, you need a reader for the, the reading the text. Yes. And you need the, the, uh, the uh, dictation for transmitting the text. So the, uh, I don't know if he played no role because he was not blind at the moment of the, of the letter, but perhaps the later. And I think it's an interesting uh, the, Okay, we are focused on the people who were too regular, but uh, the blindness. Yes. I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. Absolutely. Uh, here it's at stake. Also. Oh, thank you. No, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Did we have things on Zoom here, or any, any just follow-ups? Oh, just follow-ups. Okay. I see fourteen chats there. I'm interested in this this question of style too. I mean, isn't Montesquieu himself sort of doesn't that puzzle people that the same guy who wrote the Persian letters can write this, um, right. you know, yeah, this, absolutely. This, this, the style shifting as, as, I don't know, as, as a mode that is typical or pra being practiced by a certain, by a certain group here, right? You know, or right. Although, doubted, although, I mean, in some ways there's, you know, there's less, a little bit less, you know, there's, there's a lot of playfulness in the spirit of the laws. I mean, you know, yeah, I never really thought about it. I, I mean, I, yeah, you know, I, I mean, I mean, there's the section, there's the section, and... there's the section on, I mean, there's the section for one thing, there's the section much debated, the section where, he, where he, which is entirely ironic, where he's talking about slavery and actually denouncing slavery, although it reads almost as if an endorsement of slavery. And then there's the section on climate where he, you know, where he starts out by saying, well, I, I froze the tongue of a sheep and and saw how the fibers reacted. Maybe he's being a, a serious scientist here. I'm not so sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's uh, so how to how to read historical playfulness is, yeah, uh, it's, it's, and who's in on the joke. Yeah, exactly. Very uh, tricky. Yeah. Sorry, Sophie, would you? Yeah. Um, I mean, the other thing is the the African uh, people. Yeah. Is that in Montesquieu? I have no. No, it's not. It's, he he it's read just... that in Prévost in the in Prévost's travel collection, travel literature okay. about the Saros, but that became a bit of a. Yeah. You know, it was a commonplace for certain kinds of writers in the 18th century to say, here's a people who don't know God and don't worship a God and they're still virtuous. Drawn, right, for these, yeah. yeah. So that was, there was nothing terribly unusual about that, but it's still interesting that he put that in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, that's also in the spirit of Montesquieu, who's drawing on, of course, in the spirit of sure. laws, is drawing on examples from around the entire it's world. Usually anthropology. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. So there's, so here Lefebvre also is, is sort of saying, well, look, I can be an anthropologist mm -hmm. too. Um, yeah, Margaret, please. Um, Something that it can be light or moving, but that also it resonates so deeply with a lot of the other elements of the letter. Just the, the idea that there are books that are they should be read only with one hand, and also the you know certain ways that the spirit of the law should be read, or something along those lines. Yeah, it's interesting. And I'm just uh, mm. curious about um, whether or not that seems to, there seems to be a level of self awareness in the letter of how these things are. Um, being paired together, it is self-deprecating. You know, that he's talking about this woman philosopher, and then he's also in correspondence, or, or even just with the earlier comments of how he seems to be thinking that this is a book that he's meant to be conversing with. Right? Mm -hmm. that this is this is a book that merits five thousand words of, uh, of discourse. Yes. And I was just curious, um, yeah, in those terms of what kind of connections are you seeing between? Yeah, I mean, I, well, I mean, he himself, you know, frames it as something opposed to the spirit of the letter, because he says, you know, the letter is all about uh, d dissertating and reasoning, and this is going. But as you say, you know, I, I hadn't noticed that, you know, this notion of how it should be read—that's obviously exactly in line with the spirit of the letter. So that's a great point, and. Um, and then, of course, there's also simply the fact that he's talking about a book which is a notorious materialist book. And he himself is, at least in the letter, endorsing, you know, materialism, or at least coming close to that. So there's, so there's, so that, that intersection as well. Um, and uh, <clears throat> and then, it, of course, it is also, you know, it's, it's representative of this kind of constantly shifting style. Mm 
He says, all right, I've, I've done this, but now I'm going to do that, this, this other thing. So I think there are all sorts of ways in which it does fit in quite nicely. Yeah. I mean, when you write 5,000 words in a letter, you could be accused of a certain kind of a uh, <laughs> <laughs> I did wonder, I mean, which is to say, is he, is he, I don't know, it does seem, he is self-deprecating about it in other places. Yeah. He's like, I'm sorry, I'm putting you through, oh, serious. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 I, I mean, well, I mean, you know. I, I, you know, I have one one friend. I get endless text messages from that often seem to be five thousand right. words. Away, I hope they're not. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So it's, now we call that like the chat. <laughs> <laughs> it wears slack when you really need it, right? right. But Montesquieu would never have seen this. Could never have seen this. <laughs> do you think? The letter, no. I doubt no, it. But, I, but I, I can't maybe imagine. Yeah, it's yeah. It's, it's, it's no, I, really, I, I mean, if if Lefebvre decided to actually send these criticisms to Montesquieu himself, we have no record of it. And you know, if Montesquieu, I mean, I've I've, got, I've gone through all of Montesquieu's correspondence from actually from 1749 onwards, just to just because the new volume has just been published that takes it up, just to see whether okay. you know by chance there was any. Yeah. No, 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 not that I found so far. That's what's different from book review, right? Yeah. Of author bypassing the other author to the readers in general. Yeah. And he says a much more sort of intimate right. conversation. Exactly. Yeah. You have the draft of Henry's response? Uh, no, I, I don't have the. He, he didn't. He didn't really respond directly to this letter. Okay. I mean, if he did, I mean, as I said, normally, I mean, like all the the, the entire collection is from Henan himself. Yeah. So we have the letters to him, and then we have his drafts of the of but the letters no, back, but not all of them, probably. Oh, okay. Okay. I mean, or at least if there was one, I haven't. You know, he, he see, there's one thing where he says, you know, j'ai reçu ta, ta lettre du whatever. <laughs> Thanks, man. Months, but, that's, but that's it. So I've got some yeah. reading to catch up on. Yeah, like, exactly. Therese fill us up. Yeah. I can't be bothered with that. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Uh, exactly. Um, David, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.